What a fantastic view from this, uh, this Western Avenue in Epping. And I'm looking there the other side of the tube tracks and that must be the uh, M11 there with the traffic scuttling past or it could be the M25 actually. Isn't that amazing? Look at the distant fields. And that's not what we're going today, we're going in a different direction, in fact the opposite direction. So today we're going looking for Boudicca's obelisk, or Bodicea's obelisk, I'm not attached to either of those, which is in uh, Upshire, just the other side of Epping Forest. So we're going to work our way around the edge of the forest, uh, over the M25, and then up to Upshire. But, oh bugger, it just started raining. So I better put the camera away in the dry and find my way up to uh, the other side of the M25. So this is uh, Bell Common on the edge of Epping and on the edge of Epping Forest. I can see blue skies ahead in the direction where I'm walking so I'm not that worried about the weather to be honest with you. So last week, literally last Sunday, a week ago, when I was walking on Swanscombe Marshes in a t-shirt I speculated about what the weather might be on uh, on our next walk, and it is literally one week ago, <laughs> one week later now, and temperatures are in the single figures. And look, I'm wearing two jackets now, a puffy jacket and a waterproof, and uh, three layers below that. So I've got five layers of clothing on. Admittedly, I've been able to take my scarf off, and uh, the clocks went back last night, so it's going to get dark about half four today and it's currently what time is it if I've set the time I think it's about I can't get my watch out but I think it's about uh, half past one so three hours of usable daylight should be okay the Copt Hall estate and we are going to go round the edge of the Copt Hall estate we can't go through here but there is a footpath and here is said footpath it's more like 50 yards and 200. You've got a similar sense of distance to me. Uh, this is one of my favourite styles in the world. Look at that. It's like a ladder. It's really tall. And it's been made completely redundant by this one next to it. So I don't know what that one is doing. But, but there's a really lovely message on here from the Essex Ramblers. In memory of uh, Bill Govey, 1911 to 1993, from all his walking friends. It's a decent stint of walking, isn't it? You see blue skies now over the Epping Uplands. Isn't that beautiful? That's basically the direction in which we're walking. We've just come back from a, a few days in the uh, in the southwest. Devon and uh, crossing the border into Somerset and it's really it is really beautiful there and we, we went for a drive across Exmoor and that's an amazing terrain isn't it I really want to go walking there and maybe do some wild camping there which apparently you can do but when I was there I really just kept thinking about getting back to uh, to Epping Forest and to the Lee Valley and walking in this territory here uh, that I really, I really miss when I'm when I have any kind of break from it. So I had to get out here today, even though I haven't got that long. It's really pining for it. So I think that is Copped Hall. You can see there on the top of that hill. Stick an arrow in there to indicate it. It's a really dominant position, isn't it? I believe that's sort of mostly used now for like functions and weddings and things like that. In Village London by Edward Walford, published in uh, 1883, he says that Copt Hall is named after the Saxon word cop, meaning the top of a hill, and that the original structure was built by the uh, monks of Waltham Abbey doesn't really say much about the people who lived or worked on the estate on Wikipedia. I think the house that's there now is Georgian. 
and there's a curious record in the 1630s of the windows of the long gallery being blown in by a hurricane. After a while, you get a little bit... I think you get a bit tired of reading about the lords and earls and monarchs who just owned the land and built things there. And when they don't say anything else <laughs> about, about that area. So after a period of time, it, sometimes you think, oh, God, so this earl sold it to this, you know, baron. I, I'm interested in the people who kind of lived on these estates and worked them and what their lives were like. Some historians do go into that, actually. Michael Wood, the brilliant historian, presenter of numerous documentaries on the BBC, he's very good at telling sort of people's story. Quite a lot of it is recorded, actually, in various documents. That's interesting. There probably are records, actually, estate records at Copt Hall, which would tell us a lot about the people who who lived here permanently and, you know, and worked the land. This is great, isn't it? It's a pillbox, or it could be like a tank trap. In the Second World War, part of the uh, outer London defence ring. You see these all around the edge of the uh, Lee Valley. Fantastic relics in the landscape, aren't they? Across this quite rough field, this looks a little bit different to what it did two years ago. It's a lot rougher. I remember it being sort of cultivated. The almost ubiquitous teasels in my videos at this time of year. It's interesting. Um, this idea of uh, psychogeography <laughs> uh, that I sometimes talk about, I was talking about it with Ian Sinclair at the ones to tap the other week and uh, a little informal talk I'd done a couple of days before and we tend to think of it now as being an urban practice because of the classical definition of it being the effects of the built environment whether intended or not upon the human psyche but actually Walking in a landscape like this can potentially be every bit as psychogeographical because all of this around me here, all of this supposedly natural landscape is a type of built environment. These field systems were laid out, these hedgerows were built. When I was out at an earthwork the other week, the Iron Age earthwork, that's a built structure in the woodland. So we should kind of scrutinise, I suppose, these landscapes as much as we would Westfield or <laughs> any kind of new development, in a way, if you like. I mean, you can do what you want. You can just walk across the field and admire the beauty of the trees and listen to the bird song. But I'm, I suppose what I'm trying to say is these things aren't mutually exclusive. Like, there isn't such an enormous difference between walking over a hill and through farmland like this as there is to, to walking through a shopping centre or a new block of high-rises or across a Georgian square or wherever, you know. Probably doesn't make any sense at all. Just a reminder that you're on land owned by the Corporation of London. I think this is called the Epping Forest Buffer Lands. Again, I could be wrong. This is Copt Hall Green. Last time I did, I walked up the side of this wood here, and that was delightful, because really my aim that day was to go up to the highlands above uh, Waltham Abbey to get a lovely kind of winter sunset, which I did from the other side of Galley Hill Wood. But today I'm gonna go along this little road here, and then hopefully turn up towards the obelisk. It always amazes me that when you come out into London's countryside, there's never anybody here. <laughs> Nine million people over there, all crammed in, queuing up in Westfield. Come out here, <laughs> not a soul around. You think people would be pouring out here, wouldn't you? But there you 
you go. I'm not complaining, by the way. So this is called Long Street. And now it's sort of interesting to look at this terrain through the eyes of the uh, 18th century people who put the monument up, believing that it was around here that Boudicca Bodicea took her life with poison berries. I've been reading Peter Ackroyd's book, Foundation, volume one of his sort of narrative history of England, I think, rather than Britain. It's a really interesting book. It's a really interesting way of looking at that period. I found it fascinating. And I've just read the period that deals with the Roman invasion and uh, Boudicca, Bodicea. It's, uh, it's really fascinating, that. What does slightly perplex me, though, is that when you read the story of, you know, the, the final battle, even the battles that preceded it, the huge army that Boudicca or Bodicea is said to have amassed to attack Colchester and to attack London, and we have the archaeological evidence of that in London, the brown line or the black line in the substrata that indicates the point at which London was burnt down by Boudicca's uh, army, the Iceni and their allies. Um, there's no evidence of the supposed final battle. And you think tens of thousands of people fighting, dying, all those swords and spears and bodies bits of chariot, all of that, you think they'd be that, you think something would have turned up, wouldn't you? Anyway, so still, <laughs> I don't want to kill the myth, because <laughs> it's the myth we're following here, and the myth that when Boudicca, Bodicea, was confronted with her death, or her capture by the Romans, she took her own life, rather than fall into the hands of the Romans, either by poison berries, or by uh, another means by which she uh, ended up bleeding out and her blood flowing into the waters of the Cobbins Brook. Good stories, no archaeology. Don't let that destroy a good story though. Maybe this fallen footpath sign is evidence of the battle that took place here. <laughs> anyway, this is the footpath that leads beside the field where I believe the obelisk is. So did Boudicca stagger through this wood with a handful of poison berries? despairing at her fate. Wow, well, there it is. There's the Boudicca Obelisk. Wow, what a great place to raise such a monument though. To this story, this myth. This incredibly potent myth. There's such a commanding view over the surrounding terrain. I don't know who it was who actually raised this monument. I think it was done in the 18th century, which is the time when they were sort of very interested in the distant past of, of Britain and of England. And it's the era of William Stukeley, as we've been talking about in previous videos. But it is a really glorious thing to have in the landscape, just to prompt thinking about that story. When you read Peter Ackroyd's version, it's a lot more kind of complex than the primary school version, of course. You know, the Iceni were also not just fighting against the Romans, it was a, a, a local dispute as well. Other tribes that were allied to the Romans fought back against the Iceni as well. I mean, this isn't the kind of tribal land of the Iceni. This is, I think, the Trinovantes, I think. There are a couple of other places that claim to be the final resting place of Boudicca, or the place where Boudicca finally died. Uh, there is another one in the Lee Valley, I think further along up the Lee Valley, and there's a couple in other places. The final battle was said to have taken place at King's Cross, hence it was called uh, Battle Bridge for a number of years. This is an amazing spot, and the views stunning, absolutely stunning. I think the old antiquarians link Boudicca to the area because they believe that nearby Amesbury Banks in Epping Forest was Boudicca's camp, either used as the staging post for her raid on London or as the site of her final stand. Unfortunately, the archaeology doesn't back it up. Now I'm going to continue along this really beautiful footpath here. Oh, there's like a 
a building on a hill there. I think that's the ruins of a temple, which I believe may be a contemporary of the obelisk. Who knows? It may have even been by the same landowner that had built it. So we're about to cross Wallis Park, owned by the Corporation of London since uh, 1986. This is Metropolitan Green Belt. Let's go and explore. This is where I currently am, near um, Obelisk Farm. I'm going to go across here. It's quite let's go all the way up to here, and then you can drop down, I believe, into Waltham Abbey. should go up to that rotunda for a look. Rotunda was built in 1737 by Richard Morgan and the landscaping he laid out also included the Boudicca obelisk. But there are the most fantastic views from up here. We're currently here and I want to head towards these nurseries and then take this footpath down here from the nurseries down into Waltham Abbey. I think it's about an hour of daylight left. That should be doable unless I do my usual thing of going in the wrong direction. Either way at this stage we're going to end up in Waltham Abbey, a place I've grown very fond of over the last sort of five years or so. I think this land here, Wallis Park, and possibly where the obelisk is, is what's called Metropolitan Open Land. Is that correct? I'm sure somebody on the comments will correct me on this. All right, so I think this is the house. Wallis Park House. A grand mansion. Heard of castle in this field here that I'm walking through. And they're really having a proper old munch, aren't they? Wow, that really is quite palatial, isn't it? So you can just come off that field and wander up to the house as I'm doing now. I know I said earlier that I'm not so interested in the wealthy people that owned these properties in the past, but there are some associations here at Wallis that are impossible to overlook. I was interested to discover that at one point this house belonged to members of the hugely influential Buxton family. Now I've got an interest in the Buxtons because they used to live in Leytonstone at Leytonstone House and Edward North Buxton was partly responsible for the preservation of Epping Forest and I still take his Epping Forest guidebook on my walks with me in the forest. It was published in 1888. The Buxtons who lived here at Warleys were descendants of Thomas Fowle Buxton who worked with William Wilberforce to bring about the abolition of slavery. Previous to that, it had belonged to Samuel Fox who was the son of John Fox who wrote the famous Book of Martyrs in the 16th century which includes my namesake, John Rogers the Martyr, who was burnt at Smithfield in 1555. This is my first real taste of winter light now, and I can see the sun getting lower in the sky now. It's about 10 to 4. This is about 40 minutes until sunset. The thing with winter is the sun sets and then it gets dark pretty quick. But um, I do love this time of year for walking. Some of my most memorable walks are around this time. It's really glorious. This guy's got horns over there, that cattle. It's never good being this close to something that could kind of gore you to death if it wanted to. I think though, it's a bit preoccupied with eating as much grass as it possibly can. The final few fields now before sunset. 
I think I can get in the route that I wanted to do before it gets completely dark. Let's see, shall we? So I think this is looking back across the Lee Valley, across Waltham Abbey and beyond. That's an interesting thing to see on the other side of a gate that you've come through when you've walked across the field with the bull in it. This is a situation I frequently find myself in, particularly on winter walks. I'm getting to the end of the daylight and I'm trying to work out whether I've got enough time to kind of carry on, whether I need to take a shorter route to get me back before I lose the daylight. And of course, the thing that worries me there is walking along the little sort of narrow lanes that have no footpaths in in the dark. It's quite dangerous, really. But of course, when it's like this and you get into the sunset, the last thing you want to do is give up your walk, right? <laughs> you want to keep going. This is the Cobbins Brook, running down off the high ground above Epping Forest and down through Waltham Abbey to meet the River Lee. And in one of the many Boudicca myths, it said this is where she bled out her blood, merging with the waters of the Cobbins Brook. I get very uncertain of my way at this point. There's a field here, a show jumping field. I'm pretty sure I go along the edge here. If in doubt, go along the edge of a field, I always say. And look, there's another obelisk in this field. This one's a brick obelisk. And that was the sound of a shotgun very close by. And uh, one of the things I learned as a child is don't walk in front of a shotgun doesn't end well. Well, I seem to have come to a bit of a impasse here. Warning trespassers will be prosecuted and someone shooting a shotgun very close by. And then on the other hand, over there, very clear locked gate with private property. And the footpath kind of goes around this nursery here, but I can't see any sign of it. It's not in the dark, it's not really the time to go trespassing on a farmer's land. Every now and again, you just have to accept the fact that you've got to turn back and go a different way. Pretty strong motivation not to uh, try and find <laughs> the footpath there, which could well have been closed. My maps are about, I don't know, 15 years old probably. So it does happen. And it's about to get dark in about the next sort of 15, 20 minutes or so. So I'm going to turn back a different way. There's a nice footpath here across the field that should take me into the edge of Waltham Abbey and uh, avoid me getting shot as well, which is, I always think, a bonus on a walk. <laughs> There's the sunset coming now. It would be nice to have gone to high ground to see that, but even so, how magical. Well, I'm out of breath. I did get to get onto a hill for sunset. Here I am. Wow, it's really beautiful up here. And I'm quite surprised. I thought this footpath was going to take me down along the edge of the field below the hill. This is really magical. Wow. Back out now onto this tarmac road, which I suppose signifies in some ways the end of the walk, and now it's the walk after the walk where I realise just how far away I am from any kind of public transport. I'm probably a good two to three miles away from uh, Waltham Cross Station. <laughs> so I'll be walking along the roads in the dark now for about the next hour. But what an amazing walk. And thank you for coming with me. We had two obelisks rather than one. Wallis Park with that kind of, you know, that rotunda on the hill, amazing views. Mythology of Boudicca. Where will we be next time? Who knows? Always welcome your suggestions. 
Right, <laughs> I'll try and get back to Leytonstone now, somehow, in the dark. <laughs> Wish me luck.